Hey there guys and gals, Anime Dude here, and today I'm going to be doing something a bit different. As you can probably tell from the title, I have a few different series that I want to talk about, but there's actually only one out of the three where I recommend watching the anime, and even that probably has some strong nostalgia bias involved. However, I do want to make it clear that I'm no manga elitist, and I'm not just here to bash on anime in general. Heck. I'm the anime dude. It's just that this video is about different manga series written by Koji Seo, and his works usually don't get adaptations that do them justice. I'll be sure to elaborate on that a bit for each individual series that we talk about. In addition to the fact that I'm going to be recommending manga rather than anime, I want to go ahead and clarify that these series are all a bit etchy. I'm definitely recommending them more so for their drama and romance, but just know that I don't recommend them to anyone uncomfortable with nudity. In other words, if there are any anime titty haters out there, you have been warned. In fact, if you're the type that can't even appreciate a good old badonka donk, then you may not even make it through this here video. However, if you are a truly cultured individual that can respect both women and their booties, then sit down, dim the lights, and grab some popcorn, cause this video is gonna be awesome! Are you ready for me to start the video now? Well, okay then, here goes nothing. Do you like cute anime girls? Koji Seo writes stories that have cute anime girls. Boom! Read all of his series, enough said, roll credits, and a video. In all seriousness though, I guess I should start out by talking a bit about the first ever non shonen series I ever watched, Suzuka. This is a show where I'm actually willing to say that the anime is worth the watch, though as I stated earlier, there may be some intense nostalgic bias there. I mean, it only has a 7.3 average on Mal, but it was basically my first, and I remember it being one of the biggest roller coasters of a series that I'd ever experienced, and I personally loved every second of it. Anyways, anime adaptation aside, why should you give this manga a chance, and why is it worth your valuable time? Well, I guess I should start by saying that Koji Seo is known for his melodrama. And once you're invested in one of his works, then woo buddy, get ready because he always, and I do mean always, manages to beat you over the top of the head with a wide array of emotions. Melodrama is basically the junk food of entertainment, and it's seldom you'll find me calling anything that relies on it a masterpiece. But get your butts ready because over the years, I feel like Koji Seo has mastered the art of writing spicy junk food that's not completely junk food. Rather, his works usually have some substance behind the spice, and anybody reading one of his series had better get ready for a wild roller coaster, cause the feels train is gonna be coming to town. Usually, when you hear the term feels train, you immediately think that a series is going to be sad, and that the entire appeal is that it can make you sad. While there are definitely moments within all of his series that bring about a bit of sorrow, it'd be completely blasphemous to say that Koji Seo relies on it. When reading Suzuka, there were many times where I felt happy for the characters, sad for the characters, angry at the characters, or just plain lost about how to even feel alongside them. Honestly speaking, the story of Suzuka doesn't really have anything too special or unique about it when starting out, but I do want to talk a bit about the aspects that made this series stand out to me. For starters, the characters are heavily invested in track and field, especially Suzuka. Likewise, Koji Seo was also in the track and field club back in his high school years, so in a way, this series totally has a bit of a focus on sports, and that focus is pretty realistic unlike most of the sports anime out there. They legitimately have to work their butts off just to jump a centimeter higher or to run a split second faster, and you can tell that Koji draws from his own experiences when he shows them practice. That may be a minor detail for the most part, but it was something that I really enjoyed. Believe it or not, most shows that focus on romance, romance, and more romance purely for the sake of romance are actually hard for me to become invested in. I would just much rather there be some sort of secondary focus. Don't get me wrong, I love it when series have both romance and drama, 
but if those are the only things that the characters are ever worried about, then it's usually pretty difficult for me to get personally invested. I mean, characters are meant to portray people, and that's difficult to do when they come off as one-dimensional, which brings me to the next aspect of this series that stood out to me, the characters. Now I know I'm always going on and on about all the characters in each series that I talk about or recommend, it's just kind of how I am. I'm a firm believer that there's not many things more important in any given series. However, I want to start out by saying that there's not a single character in this series that I see as one of my all-time favorites, despite the nostalgia. I know, shocking am I right? But honestly, there's nothing inherently unique about most of them, and it'd be wrong to try to compare them to the other characters I've talked about in my channel's Why You Should Watch series. However, the thing that does stand out about each of them is that they're just regular people. People going about their lives as they unfold each and every day, and I think most of them are portrayed pretty realistically in my humble opinion, despite the melodramatic situations they may find themselves in. I know it may not make a ton of sense to say the fact that they're regular people is what makes them stand out, but I feel like that's a much harder feat to accomplish than most people realize. Koji does a pretty marvelous job of crafting characters like that, and I feel like Suzuka is the series that shows that off the most. Yamato Akitsuki, the main character in Suzuka, transfers from the country to a school in Tokyo at the start of high school. In order to do so, he moves into a spare, apartment-like room with his aunt, who owns a public bath solely for the ladies in the local district. Now there are some college girls that also live there, and that's where a lot of the etchy moments come from at the start of the series. But honestly, even the college girls there are fleshed out over the course of the series, and they feel like unique characters in their own right. That's not to say that they get a ton of screen time or focus, but they just feel like people that have a lot more going on in their lives than we or Yamato will ever see. Basically, fan service is present, but no character exists solely for that purpose. Or, you know, at least if they do only exist for that purpose, that's not the vibe they always give off. Way to hide it, Koji. Very cool. Anyways, where was I? Oh yeah. Yamato moves in with his aunt at the start of high school, and then falls in love at first sight with a girl practicing high jump. Plot convenience warning! That girl is also transferring in to start high school due to a track scholarship, and she's going to be renting out the apartment-like room right next to his! What are the odds, am I right? While the situation may have a bit of anime spice added to it, and there's definitely some convenience there in order to make the plot extra spicy and melodramatic, it doesn't change the fact that there's nothing inherently special about Yamato's life up to that point. However, high school is a time that most people spend battling hormones and finding themselves. During that period, everything feels so much more important than it really is, and social slash emotional competencies are often pushed to the brink. Likewise, as melodramatic as this series can be, I think that it's justified to an extent. One of the biggest complaints I've seen on this series is how dumb some of the things the characters do are, or how romantically driven some of the motivation is, but I personally think that just adds to the realism. Yamato starts out the series as a genuine young teenager that hasn't gone through much in his life up to that point, and likewise he's pretty clumsy and carefree. He may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but his actions usually make some sense. After all, the characters are driven much more by emotion than they are by logic, and while that's likely the case for most series in this genre, you can't deny that people do dumb things in response to their emotions. Even the main heroine of this series is pretty much unpredictable until you learn more about her and her past. Her mood swings often correlate with the internal struggle she's experiencing over the course of the series. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that while the characters' actions don't always make logical sense from an outside perspective, their personal logic is all so consistent in that they're heavily driven by their emotions. Suzuka herself is by and large one of the most realistic heroines that I've come across to date, even after all these years. Anyways, as I said, I don't think it's any secret that most high school freshmen fall victim to their emotions, and likewise a lot of the actions in this show may have shallow motives out of the gate. 
However, I stand by my statement that this series focuses on the characters finding themselves as their lives unfold. While someone may start doing an activity in the name of love, that doesn't mean they can't start to love that activity outside of the initial emotional connection that got them into it. Shallow motivation doesn't really matter whenever it helps to expand one's horizons. Like, let's say your ex got you into an anime, and then you broke up. You're not suddenly going to stop liking that anime, right? Another example would be Sakuragi starting basketball because he falls for the team captain's sister, and then gradually falling in love with the sport itself. But I'll save the discussion of Slam Dunk for another video. Going back to the discussion at hand, Yamato starts out the series centering pretty much everything he does around Suzuka, and while I know that's an aspect that gets a lot of criticism initially, let me say that a character should not be judged by how they start out, but rather how they end up. Funny enough, that brings me to the third aspect of this series that I wanted to talk about. This is a series that carries us through to the end of their high school days, but it spends a long time addressing what they plan to do after the fact, and then we even get to see an epilogue of where they end up. While the 26 episode anime adaptation ends at a point where most high school romance anime do, it shows us less than half of the entire series, and the manga continues onwards in order to give us more closure. Now whether a relationship between Yamato and Suzuka ever comes to fruition is something that I would love to not have to spoil, but honestly, whenever you have a dramatic, coming of age romance anime like this, it's way more about the journey than it is the ending. To elaborate a bit, as with anyone else, Yamato makes decisions that most would deem to be mistakes, but it's up to him to mature and take responsibility for those mistakes, even if it jeopardizes what he initially thought his own future would be. Since the next series I'm going to be talking about actually got an anime adaptation a few years back, I'm sure there's plenty of you that already know where I'm going with this and how these two series tie together. So without spoiling anything between the start of Suzuka and the outcome, Yamato and Suzuka have a kid, or a daughter to be more exact. The journey is what really makes this series so good because seeing Yamato and Suzuka mature from the 15 year olds we see in chapter 1 into parents that put aside their own futures in order to put their baby first was amazing, and it's definitely a journey I recommend you experience for yourself. If that's still not enough to convince you to give this manga a try, then I guess there's only one more thing left to do. Do you like cute anime girls? Suzuka has cute anime girls! BOOM! Nuff said! That is why you should read Suzuka. Oh crap, I was going to talk about multiple series in this video, huh? My bad. Force of habit. Anyways, speaking of Yamato and Suzuka's daughter, her name is Fuka, and she actually gets a manga series of her own that was published from 2014 to 2018. This is also a series that I recommend, but this time around, I honestly can't bring myself to recommend the anime. It's not terrible, and I'm not trying to be a hater, but it was simply nothing special. It was average at best. I was beyond excited for it when it was first announced, but by the end, I found myself to be extremely disappointed. I made this video to talk about the works of Koji Seo, and the anime somehow managed to ruin everything Koji Seo wish about the story. How did it manage that, you may ask? By diverging and changing the story itself midway through. Anyways, going back to the manga, it starts out following a character named Yu Haruna, who loves to use Twitter. Speaking of Twitter, follow me on Twitter at the anime dude. It's by far the best place to find me if you ever need to get in touch or talk to me about something. I know, I know. My addiction to the platform is very unhealthy. But that's why I was able to relate to you, Haruna, right away. Way to appeal to the modern audiences, Koji. Very cool. But moving on and speaking honestly for a bit, I don't think Haruna starts out as anything special, nor does the story of Fuka in its entirety. In fact, within the first few pages, we already have Fuka and Haruna accidentally bumping into one another, a few panty shots, and a misunderstanding that results in her calling him a pervert or something along those lines, and then breaking his phone. I mean, by this point, we've basically already been introduced to the moral of the story. That's right. The lesson in this story is that you don't play on Twitter while walking, kids. 
Some girl with anger issues will think you're trying to get a panty shot, then boom! Bye bye phone! What? What do you even do after that? Get a replacement phone? Well if you do, then don't climb up to the roof and try to take pictures for Twitter because it'll all happen again and she'll throw your replacement phone off the roof too. J Does she not know how much those things cost? I mean, we're like 10 pages into chapter 1. Seriously. There's not enough phones in all of Japan at this rate. Anyways, I remember that I really, really didn't like Fuka or Haruna up to this point. And though they were both able to show a bit of a better side of themselves before the end of the first chapter, my first impressions of them weren't the best. That being the case, this doesn't sound like the type of series I'd normally recommend, right? Well, not quite, as this series showed me that first impressions aren't everything. Both of them actually grew on me incredibly quickly, especially Fuka. Her initial outbursts of anger aside, her character's charisma simply has a way of roping you in. And as far as Haruna goes, just because a character doesn't have much to make them stand out doesn't inherently make them a bad character. In fact, it can work out really well for a coming of age story, and when executed right, seeing that character change and develop themselves over time can be extremely rewarding. That's the case with Haruna, and likewise this series just takes a bit of patience whenever you're starting out. Going a bit more in-depth on Haruna, he starts out the series as a soft-spoken, anti-social Twitter addict that sees the internet as the only place he can enjoy himself. Seeing him of all people being pulled into the world of music is a pretty cool experience to say the least. Oh yeah, I guess I hadn't really mentioned it before, but Fuka is actually a manga that's centered pretty heavily around music. Fuka's parents were both track athletes, and likewise she has talent in track. However, children aren't bound by their parents' footsteps. She just never really developed much of an interest in it. Instead, she'd much rather listen to music than play games or be on Twitter or, you know, whatever all the other young whippersnappers are doing these days. She even listens to all of her music on an old CD player. Whenever you stop to consider the fact that her character is a teenage girl in the modern day, it really is refreshing to see how unique her perspective on life is. She doesn't really have or want a phone at all because having all the answers in front of you isn't really living in her opinion. That would be boring. In fact, it's almost like Koji is trying to tell us something by putting these two polar opposite characters together in the same series. Like, maybe we'd all be more productive and engaged with everyday life if we weren't so caught up in our phones and social media all the time. Nah, that can't be it. I mean, look at me! I'm on Twitter all the time and my upload schedule is awesome! Anyways, like most of you have likely surmised, Haruna is pulled into the world of music by Fuka in very much the same way that Yamato was pulled into the world of track by Suzuka. In that respect, I guess a lot of Koji's works follow a similar trend, as meeting the heroine usually changes the protagonist's life in one way or another. Usually, it's in a way that they'd have never imagined otherwise. As far as Haruna and Fuka go, their unique dynamic helps to bring out the best in both of them. But as much as they shine throughout the series, I'd be lying if I said I didn't love the other members of the cast as well. Quite a bit, actually. I don't want to talk about all of them in length, because that could be an entire video unto itself someday, not to mention that it would just make this one way too long and drawn out. But my personal favorite character in Fuka is a guy named Mikasa, who is one of Fuka's closest friends. He's a very handsome and charismatic guy that stands out quite a bit in Japan since he has foreign blood and blonde hair. When he's first introduced, Haruna actually becomes a bit jealous of how close an attractive guy like him is to Fuka. However, it's not long before he finds out that Mikasa is gay, and pretty openly at that. He's still a pretty normal guy that's not flamboyant by any means, so seeing one of the main cast members represent the LGBT community was pretty cool, and it's definitely something that's not done often enough. Not only that, but the fact that he knows he has nothing to be ashamed of, and he has no desire to lie in order to conform to the mold of society is pretty admirable for a kid his age. His character really seems to embody the ideal of being true to oneself, However, while he is gay, that small characteristic is far from what defines his character, and I'd be doing him a disservice if that was all I talked about. He's a very caring and insightful guy that really looks out for his friends. 
Though he can be extremely poetic and wise whenever he speaks, what makes him one of my favorite characters is that his insightful nature is complemented really well by his laid back and easygoing personality. His jokes and teasing usually make most of the panels he's on so much more interesting. Heck, the Fujiyoshi fangirls within the series seem to enjoy imagining him in a love triangle with some of the other dudes in his circle of friends, including Haruna, and that probably cracks me up more than it should. Now that may not sound funny to everybody listening, but whenever he's able to just so casually join in and tease along without really being serious, I don't know, it just kind of works. In addition to that, since this is a musical anime, I guess it won't spoil much to say that he won the Junior International Piano Competition when he was younger. Yet, despite all the praise I've given him, and despite being arguably the most well accomplished and talented of the main cast when it comes to music, he still doesn't have everything figured out. Honestly, there's a ton about him that I could talk about and elaborate on, such as the fact that his seemingly free-spirited nature is a direct result of his complicated home life. But I feel like I've spent too much of this video already talking about this one character, even though he's the type of character I could dedicate an entire analysis video to. If that's something that you guys would be interested in, then let me know, but I honestly might do it even if nobody's interested. Maybe that's the reason I'm not relevant. Anyways, the main cast of Fuka is arguably my favorite out of any of Koji Seo's works, and the great supporting characters such as Mikasa are only one of the reasons why. I'm not going to spoil the main thing that made me fall in love with this series, but I will say that 30 something chapters in, a tragedy occurs that changes the lives of our characters quite a bit. Seeing the extent to which that fateful event affected each of the main characters on a personal level was amazing, and for me, it was where the series really started. I know it's a bit cliche and generic to say that characters are great because they develop, but this event was the catalyst for a crap ton of development. The aftermath really pushes each character to face themselves and reevaluate their lives. Haruna in particular had already transformed from some aimless antisocial kid into someone who practiced his butt off in order to try to keep up and not let his friends down. So seeing him go a step further and dedicate his entirety towards music made me feel like I haven't felt since I read Beck. That's largely why I assumed that this would be one of the greatest musical anime since Beck. I was wrong to say the least, and the anime adaptation fell short, but I still feel like this series doesn't let me down as a musical manga. To elaborate a bit, I feel like I've already made it pretty clear that the strongest aspect of Koji Seo's writing is his ability to convey emotions. The essence of each of his series relies entirely on their ability to create an emotional impact, and when I say that, I don't just mean that they make you sad but rather it focuses on making you feel a wide array of emotions alongside each of the characters. When I first realized that Fuka was a manga that focused so heavily on music, I was a bit surprised. Koji Seo ran track in high school, so that being a part of Suzuka was understandable. However, he's never been in a band. Likewise, I initially assumed he was just looking for some way to change up the feel of the series while still primarily focusing on the characters. Regarding that thought, I was only partially correct. He does indeed focus heavily on the characters, but the musical aspect of the series wasn't just some arbitrary thing. Rather than just sweeping it to the side, he uses it as a way to enhance upon the emotional impact. Music and emotions aren't things that are meant to be kept separate, not by a long shot. Rather, when strong emotions are felt, it's the ability to express those emotions through your music that makes you a true musician. The two are at their best when they're in harmony with one another, and that's a consistent message that Koji focuses on from the get-go. That combination is one that truly helps this cast to shine, and in the end, it's all about following your heart and controlling your own destiny. They follow their hearts throughout their musical journey, and they do so because what truly matters isn't whether you can do something, it's whether you will. And that is why you should read Fuka. Also, do you like cute anime girls? Fuka has cute anime girls! Boom! Read this series! Next, manga! So in addition to running track in high school and relaying that experience through Suzuka, 
Koji Seo grew up in the country, Hiroshima to be more exact. Later in his life, he moved to Tokyo, around the area where the Suzuka and Fuka series both took place. Because of those experiences, we see a lot of similarities in his main characters, as both Yu Haruna and Yamato Akitsuki both moved to Tokyo at the start of each of their respective series. With that in mind, Kimi no Irumachi is not only the next series that I want to talk about, but it literally translates to a town where you live, and it takes place in Koji's hometown. As you've probably already guessed, the main character of this series, Haruto Kirishima, lives in that town. When the series kicks off, a girl by the name of Yuzuki Eba moves from Tokyo to stay with him and his family. Now this may seem like a pretty generic way to start a spicy series like this, and it totally kind of is, but Koji makes it work. While Eba decides to stay with Haruto's family for various personal reasons, along with the fact that her dad is friends with his dad, the dynamic is still relatively interesting because Haruto likes a different girl. Bada bing, bada boom, we already have ourselves one of Koji's famous love triangles, so this is gonna be a wild ride. Except, while the first part of the story can be entertaining and eventful, it's primarily a way for us to get to truly know a lot of the characters, to prep us for what's to come. You see, the thing I love about Kimi no Ilumachi is that unlike most anime or manga, it doesn't just focus on high school life. While most series are zoned in on youth and seem to end whenever a couple is formed and they hold hands or almost kiss or something along those lines, this series is a bit different. It goes well beyond high school. It focuses on college. It focuses on finding a job after college. It simply focuses on life, which, as I said, shockingly includes stuff after your school days as well. Huh, who knew that was even a thing? I'd always assume that life after high school was just some sort of myth. Anyways, Kimi no Ilumachi has a lot to cover, and because of that length it arguably fell off a bit towards the end. Or rather, it arguably lasted a tad bit too long and felt dragged out for some people when it got close to its conclusion. However, despite that heads up, I'm sure that opinion may vary based on the individual reading it. Isn't that right fellow shonen fans? Nothing ever really feels dragged out to us, does it? Generally speaking though, Kimi no Irumachi was seen as a lot more realistic than Koji's other works, even if it is a bit of a slower burn. Now I'm a sucker for a series that details a character's life, even well beyond their school days. However, another reason I'm bringing up the length of this series is because the manga has over 260 chapters. The original OVA of the series is 2 episodes while the adaptation of the series is 12 episodes. Again, just in case you didn't hear me the first time, over 260 chapters, 14 total episodes, with overlap in some of those episodes. Kimi no Ilumachi had many great moments throughout its long run, and the anime basically seemed determined to get as many of those in there as it could without much buildup or reason for the audience to even care. That's not to say that the anime adaptations are terrible, because I do know people that like them and it's not like they really changed the story. However, generally speaking, there's a reason their scores on my anime list are so much lower than the mangas, and that's because they pretty much fail as a standalone work. The anime feels rushed, and I mean, of course it would be. They were just trying to get through some of the more juicy parts for such a huge series in just 12 episodes. When dealing with a series that relies so heavily on making an emotional impact, rushing like that really shows, and not in a good way. For a bit of perspective, this series has more chapters than pre-time skip Naruto, and that alone should help to explain why it didn't work out when they just squeezed as many melodramatic moments as they could into such a short runtime. Between Kimi no Irumachi and Fuka, it really pains me that Koji's works never get the adaptations that they deserve. However, let's move on from that and go back to talking about why you should read the manga. While I was actually excited that Suzuka gave us closure, I was even more excited when I realized the extent to which Kimi no Irumachi covered the protagonist's life. I'll admit that I couldn't really relate to him a ton at first since he was even more romantically driven than the main characters of Koji's other works, which is saying something. However, he has some unique qualities to him, and while his childhood aspirations to become a chef may not have been completely sincere at first, 
That on its own is actually something that's kind of relatable about him. I'm sure most of us have had something in our lives that we've wanted to do as a result of the following thought process. I want to do such and such when I get older because I'm kind of good at it, or at least so and so said I'm pretty good at it. Once you're confident about something or you're praised about something, it's easy to just kind of pursue that thing. Haruto tends to kind of do this with cooking, as in he usually cooks for his family, they tell him he's good at it, and so he tries to learn more about it and pursue it as a future career in his spare time. As he does so, there's usually plenty of distractions throughout this lengthy story that keep things interesting, and so cooking is seldom his primary focus, and usually winds up as more of an excuse than anything else. Yamato is passionate about track, and Haruna is passionate about music, but cooking is something that Haruto often puts on the back burner when his focus is elsewhere. Despite that, he's just taking life one day at a time as he tries to find out what he wants out of it. Not only can that be relatable, but it has its own type of appeal, and that appeal helps to separate Kimi no Irumachi from some of Koji's other works. It has some moments that truly hit me harder than almost anything else I've ever read. Like I've stated so many times already, Koji is a master at manipulating a wide array of emotions in his audience. I think that the slower and more realistic burn of Kimi no Irumachi, along with the fact that the protagonist likes to live in the moment, helped to make some of the more emotional scenes hit harder than I ever imagined they would. That impact isn't just a result of plot twists and big events like with most melodramatic series, but rather it's from the buildup that gets you invested leading up to those events. It's hard for me to definitively say this for sure, but this may very well be my favorite Koji Seo series. Also, there's these 9 secret chapters that Koji did after the 200th chapter called 200.1, 200.2, 200.3, .2, and so on. Also, he did the same thing for Fuka too. Crazy, right? And while I'd rather not publicly say what these chapters are about, I guess I can summarize them real quick for you. Do you like cute anime girls doing naughty things? These special chapters have cute anime girls doing naughty things. Boom! Read all of these chapters. Disclaimer, that recommendation only goes for those of you above the age of 18. Actually, speaking of being over 18, aside from the obviously pervy elements to this story, I really do feel like this series tackles a solid portion of its subject matter in a pretty mature way, despite being released in a weekly shonen magazine. I mean, it arguably does become a bit more cliche and predictable later on down the line, but by that point I'd already been hooked by its realistic yet eventful first half, so... Any cliches or melodrama didn't really bother me too much in the later parts of the story. I was just busy enjoying myself while following along with the characters I'd grown attached to, and that goes for both of the times I read it. Who knows, if you give it a try too, then you may very well become as invested as I did during the first half of the series, and if that happens, then choo choo! All aboard the feels train. No refunds, no turning back. You're here for the long haul, buckaroo. And if that didn't convince you, then how about this? Do you like cute anime girls? Kimi no Irumachi has cute anime girls! Boom! Read this series! To speak generically about each of the three works we've talked about for a bit, I think it's pretty awesome how they all take place in the same universe and reference one another pretty consistently. In this way, not only do we get to know all of the characters really well, but the characters that we've grown to know and love are utilized as background characters in other series as well. While it's pretty well known that Fuka's parents make a few appearances in her series, the cast of Kimi no Irumachi appears quite a bit as well, and they even get an entire chapter dedicated to them later on in the series. The Marvel Cinematic Universe has nothing on the Koji Seo manga universe. If you by any chance disagree with that, then take this argument into consideration. Do you like cute anime girls? Well, the Marvel Cinematic Universe doesn't have any cute anime girls. Boom! Koji's works are better. Also, while various girls usually develop a bit of a crush on the main characters, these stories aren't harems with wishy-washy, I like everybody type of protagonists. Koji Seo is much more of a love triangle kind of guy, and the main characters usually don't go out of their way just to get their dick wet. Anyways, I also want to generally speak about each of these series when I clarify that I don't think any of them are necessarily masterpieces by any means. They're all just really solid series that I've read multiple times without the slightest bit of regret. 
I honestly won't hesitate to recommend them to anyone that seems even slightly interested, which I'm assuming you are if you've made it this far into the video. I mean, you can trust my tastes. No worries there. Ask anyone. I promise you that anyone who truly knows me will tell you. I may be a total shonen scrub, and I'm definitely 100% isekai trash, but even more than that, I simply love taking a ride on the good old melodramatic feels train, and there are few series out there that do it for me quite as well as the works of Koji Seo. Not only that, but despite their similarities, each of the series that we've talked about has something different that appeals to me. Suzuka for the nostalgic aspect and the fact that it has a sports focus, Fuka for its stellar cast of characters as well as its musical focus, not to mention how well that musical focus blends in with the rest of Koji's style, and last but not least, Kimi no Irumachi for its extensive coverage of the characters' lives that goes well beyond their school days, as well as its great build-up to some heavy-hitting moments. They're all very emotionally driven series that will have you feeling every which way once you're invested, so I really do recommend that you give each of them a try. In conclusion, do you like cute anime girls? The works of Koji Seo all have cute anime girls. Boom! You should read the works of Koji Seo. I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, then remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any future videos. I mean with long videos like this, I'm not going to be posting very often, so it's not like I'm going to be blowing up your phone or anything. Also, thank you to everyone over on Patreon for making videos like this possible. I know it's probably not the smartest strategy for me to talk about stuff that I want to talk about without any regard for what's popular or trending or even without thoughts to how well my videos will do view-wise. But regardless, the fact that there are people willing to help support me as I make videos like this anyways means the world to me. Whether you're one of the patrons on screen or just someone who made it this far into the video, I want to thank you all so much for watching, and Anime Dude, out. Hey, even though I only talked about three of my favorite Koji Seo works throughout the course of this video, he actually has other works that I didn't even mention. Some of those include Crossover, Princess Lucia, some of his short stories, and even the currently airing series called Hitman. So while it would likely be a lot shorter, let me know if you want to see a part two or if there's another manga artist you want to see me cover down in the comment section below. Thank you all for watching, and Anime Dude out.